I'm Liz McDade, a huge Colombo fan and a small business owner living in Santa Cruz, California. And Paul, welcome, brother. <laughs> welcome. Um, <laughs> I'm Paul McDade, an editor and actor working in the TV and film industry in Los Angeles. And this is Trenchcoat Cigar, Peugeot, Wandering with Colombo. And every episode, We'll bring you a little Hollywood history, glamour, and behind the scenes as we walk you through Columbo, one of America's greatest TV detective series. That's right. And today we are reviewing season four, episode two, Negative Reaction. This aired October 15th, 1974. And our snack today is a hamburger bun and beef stew. And our drink is a dirty martini. And every episode, we have a snack and a drink that is inspired by the episode. So, Paul, tell me about what you got over there. I have a dry mm -hmm. martini. The vermouth, I forget the name of it. St. John, my wife, she got me some olives with blue cheese inside of them. Ooh. And then some of the onions. Oh, wow. Fancy. Pretty good. It's not chilled. Um I probably put in too much of the gin. It's a uh, the Sapphire Bombay gin. Oh yeah, that's yeah my fave. Oh, is that your favorite? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, I I heard I was a uh, we got some a while back for um oh well, recently I should say for something I forget what but um it was just kind of funny because I thought of that like we usually get uh the Scottish one bomb uh botanist. Um, but but I remember the Bombay, the Sapphire. I was like, I don't know if I ever had that before. Uh, and there was this, have you heard of Thundercat, the music? The mu No, I remember the cartoon. Yeah, it's really good. It, well, it was a, he's a singer and uh, he's been with other bands and stuff. But he has this one song where he's like, he, they're, they're like, uh, he's too drunk to get up. I forget what he says, but he talks about Bombay. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, just made me think of that too. <laughs> so sorry about that. But. I got some stew. The wandering has begun already. We've already started yeah. wandering. That's okay. <laughs> What's your, yeah, so, yeah, What's your some, stew? It's some fresh m meat, beef with potatoes, carrots, and onions. And St. John made it. And it's so good. She let it cook for a long time today. Um, That's amazing. And then some gluten-free. Thanks. Yeah, some gluten-free uh, rolls. I sent you the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you have? So I also have a little simple hamburger bun. Well, we don't eat meat, um, but I did make a vegan sloppy Joe to go in the hamburger bun. Mm. So this was actually last night's family dinner was sloppy Joe's. But you'll see if you go to our Instagram, we have photos. It looks like I'm having beef stew. Um, it's quite tasty. <laughs> And then um, I made a dirty martini with Bombay Sapphire Gin and oh wow yeah and then some kind of vermouth from Trader Joe's I didn't write down the name and just regular green olives but it's quite tasty it's quite dirty too it's it's like you know it's not clear it's definitely you put some of the olive juice <clears throat> in oh, it oh yeah yeah you have to right. Yeah, that's what really gives it a nice taste. Mm. Mm. Cheers, Paul. <clears throat> Cheers. Cheers to Colombo. Good way to start the morning, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That's what Dick Van Dyke used to say. That, this is, Just well, kidding. we'll get into it, but, but someone in this episode is starting the morning with martinis, multiple. Okay, so we um, also have a segment for our podcast. Uh, called Smoke Signals, where we read letters and emails from our listeners. Paul, you're going to kick us off here? Yes. So the first one is from Jen. Hey, Jen. Hey, Jen. Uh, answering our question from the last episode about if you like seeing violence or not. Jen says, well, I always like seeing scenes of violence, but mainly that's because I'm a fight choreographer myself. And so I like to see other people's work, especially stuff that's old school. Very cool, Jen. Yeah. Yeah, she has a, a, a book. She's written a book about it as well. I could post yeah. that probably. All. That. Yeah, in our last episode, um, Exercise and Fatality, we were we were talking about 
there's a bit of a more drawn out and graphic fight scene there. You know, it's not super typical for Columbo. So we just wanted to know what you thought about it. What do you think? So you, you, you'd rather not see it in a Columbo is kind of what you said, right? Yeah. in a Columbo, like I'm just not expecting it as much. And so it's not as, I, I don't know. I just don't enjoy it as much. Although I definitely like my fair share of action, violent movies. So, yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, like I, it, I go back and forth with all that kind of stuff. There's something with like, like with Jen said, choreography, you know, how well it's done, how realistic it looks. Um, it's even like, you know, like makeup too, if, if, you know, like, like extreme violence for some films like Saw or I saw Hereditary, my oldest wanted, wanted me to watch it. And then it was Tony Collette and it was um, horrifying but it, but she was amazing. I like, I don't know if she was nominated for that, but she was fantastic. That's some of the best acting I've seen in a long time. And I, I went along with the, the, the fun of the horrorness of it, you know, like how well can you reconstruct this looking thing? And it wasn't just about that. It was, it was a lot of really strong things about that film, but um, I've always kind of gone sort of back and forth with some of that, you know, yeah. like sometimes, um, it's like, wow, that was really extreme. Do they need that in that scene? You know? Yeah. Um, and if you can scare someone without showing anything like, uh, Laris showed me this film, my oldest boy, he showed me this, uh, YouTuber who's actually doing a film with the company that released hereditary a 24. He had done this series on, um, I think it's called pixel something on YouTube, but he did this back rooms project where he rendered everything on his own. And then he did a newer thing that has three episodes and it was so good. Like it was so awesome and there's no violence at all, but it was scary, like horrifying in a different way that I hadn't seen in a long time. I forget the name of it. I'll repost it, but it's the guy who did back rooms pixel something. Um, so, you know, you think about that, you know, also you weigh that in the effect something can have on you, whether or not they show something. Um, but I agree because people get careers out of making something look realistic, like Tom Savini, who did the Romero films. He can show anatomy. He knows how to create that. And he has a school where he teaches kids and it's, it's creative. It's like, you know, Stephen King is creative. Yeah. You know, with, even though it's these horrible, scary things, where does this come from? But it's, it's not real, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but I think for Columbo, I do like that you don't see much, usually for, for how his show goes. Yeah, totally. We'll have to link to those that you, the, um, what you mentioned there, Hereditary and then the one that you, the YouTuber one you just mentioned too. Yeah. In our um, show notes, dear listener, is where we put, and in our Insta- on our Instagram posts, we'll have some of those. Um, well, we have one more smoke signal um, from uh, Anne who's written in before she also had a comment on our last episode lesson exercise in fatality. And she pointed out, she found a, caught a little blooper. So they're near the end of the episode. Columbo's working out at the gym at Milo Janice's gym. And he's got his little cop notebook with him in his sweatsuit. And um, this is from Anne. After Liz mentioned about Columbo having his little black detective notebook in his gym clothes and rewatched that clip. And on some clips, he has the notebook and some he doesn't. Just a little blooper. And I agree with Paul. I like Milo's shirt in that scene as well. Yes. Yeah. We liked it too. There was some good fashion. Good uh, male fashion in that one. All right. Well, thank you to Jen and Ann for writing in. And if you have any thoughts you'd like to share, bloopers um, or reactions, you can always write to us or send us a message on Instagram. Our email is trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com and our Instagram is trenchcoatcigar. Okay, let's get into this one, Paul, because this is a classic Columbo. I gotta say, it's got a lot, a lot of good stuff. And here's a quick summary. A professional photographer, Paul Galesco, kidnaps and then murders his wife. He tries to pin the murder on an ex-convict, Alvin Deschler, that he's hired to help him purchase a house. 
Galesco ends up killing Alvin as well. And Columbo is immediately confused by the murder of Alvin Deschler and suspicious of Galesco. Okay, so let's get into this one, Paul, because like I said, there is a lot of good stuff. I thought I would just start with a mention of the title, Negative Reaction. It is a reference to that the end of the episode. So it's you kind of get the, the ending at the very start, but it's kind of a vague title too. So you're not, it's not like it's going to give it away. Yeah. Like you could have a bad reaction to the movie you just watched. Right. Right. But in this case, it's actually a reaction from Galesco to a negative. Yeah. That does him in, in the end, but we'll get to that. And, um, the opening scene is in a dark room. Paul Galesco, played by Dick Van Dyke, is in his dark room, his photo room in his home. And this isn't the first time that a Columbo starts in a dark room. Do you remember, mm-hmm. Paul, in Short, Short Fuse? Fuse? Yeah. Roddy McDowell's in there. Um, and a- as we saw in Short Fuse, the dark room in this scene is not being used for photography, but our villain, Paul Galesco, is making a ransom note. And he also, he, he finishes his ransom note. He packs up a little murder kit, a little murder suitcase with a camera, clock, ransom letter, and a gun. And his wife, Frances, has been at the door asking him to hurry up. She is sitting at the bar in their living room, enjoying her second martini before lunch. (laughs) (laughs) And um, this, I'm pretty sure, was filmed on a set. Um, The living room has lots of shades of gold and yellow and tan. And Mrs. Galesco, Frances Galesco, looks really great in a red suit. She's got a silky navy red and uh, navy and red shirt with a white flower brooch but she also seems like she's had two martinis before lunch um and paul really wants her to come out and see a ranch that he's purchased she's up she knows this is coming but she's still upset by this whole thing that that her husband has gone out and bought a house without talking with her about it and She's not sure she really wants to go out and see it. He loses his temper briefly with her, and she she eventually comes around and says, okay, I'll go see this. Um, but she wants to hurry because they're auctioning the most divine Revere tea set at Lillaby's. And have you heard of a Revere tea set, Paul? No. Mm-mm. I had to look this up. Um, Paul Revere, you know, a important figure in American history, was also a very skilled silversmith. I don't know oh, if you knew that. No, I, didn't. I did not know that at all. But he actually um, made some really um, beautiful tea sets. He made oh. plates and bowls and teapots and spoons, other household things from silver. And I forget what website I found this on. Some it was like a um, a museum website. Anyhow, he according to this, it, he is considered one of colonial America's most important silversmiths. And there are only a few of his tea sets still around. They're in museums, but a teapot of his would be worth about $150,000 to $250,000 today. Oh, man. Yeah, so pretty fancy teapot. That's so cool. Yeah, I know. It's a cool little um, reference in this script. (laughs) <laughs> the Yoda that our dog is just staring at me like who are you talking to <laughs> Yoda, <he's> talking <laughs> since he to can't me. hear you <laughs> it's aunt liz yoda it's okay That's right all right so it's time for a drive in the countryside and um this section or this scene rather was filmed at greenfield ranch out in thousand oaks california the location's on imdb and you can go to Google Maps, and the driveway entrance and the roads still look pretty similar to the scene in this episode of Columbo, but the trees have changed. They, maybe they 
cut some trees down and planted new trees. And I'm not sure about the actual exterior of the ranches. You're not, I'm not able on Google Maps to go in and see the actual Greenfield Ranch. But anyhow, Paul and Francis have taken a drive out to, out to this new house that Paul bought, this new ranch out in the boonies. And um, Paul wants her to see the home. And she steps into the new ranch and she is immediately disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> and she does such a good job of of conveying the emotion of disgust in this scene. <laughs> she's very displeased with the whole thing. You can tell she's just a very negative person in general. And this this home triggers a lot of that from her. Paul uh, grabs her and ties her to a chair in this little ranch house that he's purchased. And then he, once she's seated and she's tied into the chair, he takes a photo of her and then another of photo of her and she continues to be annoyed not super fearful just annoyed with him and she gets a little bit scared when he pulls out a gun and and then he shoots her and that is the last of her of Frances Galesco did you I don't know if you looked her up at all Paul I did not um I did I watched she was in prom night with Jamie Lee Curtis played her mom. She didn't have yeah much in there. And I, she was, did some other movies. I didn't get a chance to see, but um, she's born in Germany. Uh, she lived in London, but she uh, may still be alive. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think she was in the twilight zone as well, but um, yeah, she's still around. Um, she was in a murder. She wrote, of course. Yeah. I, yeah. She was in the the evil that men do Charles Bronson movie. I, I wanted to watch that cause I thought that would be fun, but yeah, I thought she was good. I, I really, uh, I thought she was American doing a British accent, you know, Oh, uh-huh. but she obviously knew the accent. So she, she, you know, she was, that was, maybe that's her regular accent, regular voice. Yeah. 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 I liked watching her. She was fun to watch for sure. I thought she did a good job of playing a very annoyed wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we learn a little bit about uh, Galesco's motive here. He says uh, for the last three years, he's felt tied to her. Um, I guess she has held him back from her, his, you know, he, he's a photographer and he's, she's held him back from being able to travel and do photo projects. And once again, you have to wonder why not just get a divorce? Why murder? <laughs> but there, I, you know, maybe he was worried about um, the money of maybe she would, you know, take half his money and that would be a problem for him. I don't know. Well, she she was the one who had the money, right? I mean, I guess he was a he's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, so he's successful there. And then now he just makes a living in the studio. And I kind of, don't they comment on that, like how that's not much, just like a make a living kind of thing. I don't recall them actually commenting about how much he makes. Um, okay. But it is possible that, yeah, it, it is her money, but they never actually come out and say that either. So, I, you know, I did watch her in the Twilight Zone because she's with Richard Basehart. So I watched it when we watched the one with where Richard Basehart was the British killer. He and his wife in the theater, they did Macbeth. Yeah, and she was good. I, I, I can't remember what happens in that. But I like the episode. I mean, I think I, I haven't, I can't recall a really bad Twilight Zone. So, <laughs> but yeah, that was one I did. That was from 1959. Yeah. Basehart is like stranded on this island. He's like a astronaut and he crashes on the, not island, but a, a planet and he meets her. I think, yeah, I think that was it. So it's called probe seven over and out. Well, um, we don't see the actual murder here. Um, you know, it's one of those Columbo's where it, you just know that it happened. Um, yeah. And, and now we, and now we move on and we're going to meet Lorna. Um, Lorna is Galesco's photography assistant and she's at their photo studio setting up some lights when the phone rings and it's uh, Galesco calling Lorna from Palmdale 
where he was taking photos. And um, Galesco announces that it, that they will go to the Philippines to do a photography tour. And Lorna is very excited, but she asks, but what about Francis? So again, we learn that Francis has been blocking him from, you know, pursuing his dreams. And Galesco says, oh, she's, she's okay with it. We talked about it. She's come around. And so Galesco is, is out in Palmdale and he's at a gas station and he is trying to establish an alibi for himself with the gas station attendant. He asks the gas station attendant if his clock is right. Is it really after two? Okay. Well, now we're going to move on. We're going to meet another main player. We're going to meet Al. I, I think of Al as a very poor sap in this episode. And um, this scene where Galesco goes to meet Al was filmed at the Hollywood Reservoir in Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles. Looks like you can actually visit this place and walk around it if you want to. Oh. Yeah. Looks really pretty. Um, so we meet Alvin Deschler. He is a man of denim from top to bottom. <laughs> He's got a cool patch on the back. He has a very cool patch on the back of his jean jacket. And Paul, I am not joking. Uh, I went to hear some live music on Friday. And there was someone at the show with a very similar design on the back of her jean jacket. <laughs> take a picture oh, i should have oh. I, I think i was worried that might be a little bit creepy yeah well you could have um, pretended you're getting the band right <laughs> yeah that's true these guys are so good these guys are so you can good. pretend like you're live streaming you know and just like <laughs> take actually uh, taking a picture could have been your good moment there detective uh, moment i know undercover <laughs> yeah i should have gotten a photo Anyhow, so we meet Alvin Deschler and we learn his backstory here. He's recently out of prison and he was helping Galesco find a home, a second home for himself. And Al picked out the ranch and did not mention Galesco to the real estate agent Magruder. And Galesco has been paying Al to help him out. And he's, Al is very, very grateful. So they set up their next meeting for the next day at a junkyard and Galesco asks Al to call him at 10 a.m. the next day. Oh, and then we also learn that Deschler's camera was stolen from his hotel room, the camera he was using to take photos of houses for Galesco. And we also learn that um, he just rented a car. Um, because I guess Galesco asked him to rent a car and, and stop taking cabs, which is another piece of his plot to pin this murder on on Deschler. Um, okay, so we're gonna head, we're gonna leave the beautiful Hollywood reservoir and we're gonna head back to Galesco's house, which is also a really beautiful space. This is a, this is a well-known house called the Madison Boyd Jones House. It's in Glendale, California. Oh. And it's actually been in a whole bunch of uh, movies and TV shows and commercials. Um, it's also known as the White House and as Bel Air. And it was the structure of the house was the model for Tara in Gone with the Wind. Okay. Um, but they didn't actually film Gone with the Wind at the house. It just inspired the inspired the home. Anyhow, it's a cool, cool looking home. It seems to still look relatively the same as it did in 1974, which is pretty cool. So Galeska's at his home and his housekeeper has pulled up to the house with two bags of groceries. Mrs. Moyland is, is her name. And she's asking about how Mrs. Galesco's feeling. And uh, Paul Galesco acts kind of distracted and says that she's gone. Let's, we're not going to talk about it. There's, you know, don't ask questions, but Mrs. Moyland is clearly confused. Yeah. And then the phone rings because it's 10 a.m. It's 
Alvin Deschler calling as instructed right on time. And Paul does a really good job of faking um, a sort of ransom kind of call with Deschler on one end, confused. Um, but galesco has got Mrs. Moylan there as an observer to, to notice and listen. So this is also helping him set up his his scheme for this whole murder. Yeah, he gets a... Uh... Alvin Deschler is yeah gets very confused. He's kind of nervous too. He's he's he does really good in this uh, Columbo. He's he's the stuff I've seen him in. He's normally not this sort of character, but he's he's even shaking when he's talking to him on the phone. Like, huh? What? What's going? What? What? what hello? <laughs> yeah, and he's like that a bit at the reservoir too. He's he's not super sure of himself. Yeah, he feels a little uncomfortable and you know deferential to Galesco for sure. Sometimes you think when you're in, in prison, if someone goes to prison, it's, it's a whole new way of living and a lot of dark things happen. But I could see how going back and then at some point, hopefully you learn your way around prison. And then but when you come back out, I, you know, the, he, it seems like he's having a hard time adjusting to that way of life in a way, or maybe he's always been that way, you know, and that's how, you know, we later on find out towards the end about him. But uh, that could be something else too. You know, here he is on the outside and, and it's hard. How do I, how do I live? Yeah. Who do I trust? Yeah. It makes sense that, that this would be a big adjustment for him, you know, coming out of prison. Yeah. What, what else did you watch him in, Paul? You saw him in something else? Oh, I'd seen him before. Yeah, he was in a couple of um, McQu Steve McQueen movies like Bullet, Papillon. And Papillon, he was only in the very beginning. That was a movie with Dustin Hoffman and Steve McQueen. Um, I watched him in – he was a real bad guy. It was called the um, – I'd seen him in a Cassavetti show, Johnny Staccato. Um, he's always really good, and he reminds me of another actor – um, but I saw him in the in a Twilight Zone where he he's able to change his face. Uh, the movie I saw from the seventies it's called oh you know the last movie not the last movie uh, oh it's called um, Dennis Hopper directed it and he plays it's called Out of the Blue Dennis Hopper him Linda Manns who was in the Wanderers uh, Days of Heaven Gummo um, I think she passed away recently uh she was a phenomenal uh actress very different um yeah she died 2020 august 14th that film out of the blue was pretty amazing in a lot of ways but there was a, there was some stuff that made me kind of concerned i think she was older when she made it she was playing she playing a younger character it's very dark but it's about the just of uh how things go bad at, at, at in households you know but it was heavy. Oh, it was really. Yeah, Don Gordon was friends with Dennis Hopper. Also, Dennis Hopper called him out of the blue from Canada, saying, "I'm doing this movie. Can you can you be in it?" Um, but he was in a couple movies. Um, that one was was good, but it's very very dark. It gets very just. Yeah. Oh, the education of Sonny Carson. He plays this corrupt cop. He 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 can play really good corrupt characters, like in The Mac, which is a famous sort of independent black black exploitation um, type film. Uh, but in Education of Sonny Carson, he plays this really corrupt cop, racist cop. Oh, The Final Conflict, <laughs> which is like oh, Damien yeah. Omen. Remember mm -hmm. the Damien Omen movies? Ah. It's the third one. Sam, Sam Neill is, is Damien when he's older, the Australian actor, and he plays his right-hand man. And it's kind of a straight role, even though he knows Damien's the son of Satan. He's just like a regular guy trying to promote this ambassador so that everybody wants to believe in him. <laughs> and then it's, it's uh, not the best film, um, but the photography is beautiful. Uh, the music, Jerry Goldsmith's cool. Uh, the locations are really cool. There's elements to the story that are really cool, but they, the writing yeah. needed a lot more help. And I think mom would really like the ending. I won't <laughs> okay. see what happens, but I don't think she All right, mom. You're watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Don Gordon... He, he's pretty cool. He, he's a he's a really uh, interesting actor. He passed away in 2017. 
Yeah, I liked watching him uh, in this. There was only one moment, and we'll get to it, where I was like, hmm, could we take do that take again, Don? Oh, yeah? <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Okay, so let's let's keep going here. Uh, Galesco has gotten the phone call, and in the next in the next scene, he is at his publisher's office, Ray, um, and he's getting some cash from Ray. He confided in Ray what you know what's going on, and Ray really wants to go with him to hand over the money and retrieve the wife. And Galesco's like, "No, I must do this alone." But you know, yeah, because he'll attract. You know, they'll really kill his wife then, Liz. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. So now we are going to go meet up with Deschler. Galesco's going to go meet up with Deschler, but f- but first he's got to finish setting up Deschler for the murder. So in the next scene, Galesco is watching Deschler's motel. And waiting for Deschler to leave for their meeting at the junkyard, which was set for 5 p.m. at a junkyard that they had looked at. This was filmed at the Sierra Pelona Motel in Santa Clarita. And this motel still looks the same. I mean, it is. Really? Yes. Like nothing has changed. Oh, wow. Here's a review from Google about the Sierra Pelona Motel from someone named Toulouse who says, this is someone in the film industry, clearly. They say, I've done a couple of locations here. Great place for a gritty hotel shoot, but I definitely (sighs) wouldn't stay here. (laughs) Every room stinks of cigarettes and has stains and feels sticky. But again, if you're filming, it's what you're looking for. I'd never lay on one of their beds. (laughs) Uh, Or stay the night. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so you might see ghost apparitions. Oh my gosh. Yeah, maybe not if a, you believe in that stuff. <laughs> maybe not a place to stay the night, but a cute spot to to get a photo. It's been in a ton of other movies and shows, including Barnaby Jones, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and The X Files. So Galesco's been staying there, or sorry, Deschler has been staying there. He drives away, and that's when Galesco breaks into his room and um plants a whole bunch of evidence to incriminate Deschler in his wife's murder. So he plants the newspapers that he used to cut the letters out of for the ransom note. He plants the glue he used, the scissors he used. He plants the camera that Deschler said was stolen. And then Galesco used it to take photos of his wife in the ranch when he tied her to the chair. It's, it seems like Paul Galesco would have put the, the uh, newspapers in a drawer or something, you know? like Yeah, I mean, he did not do a great job planting the evidence, you know? Like, he wanted it to look messy, but, like, why? So then Columbo could have a clue? <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't think this through all the way. Um, and, yeah, that's, you know, Columbo's going to get him for it. But apparently he didn't think too much, you know, like like he, he obviously doesn't realize. Yeah, that's not going to look smart. All right. So now we're off to a junkyard to meet up with Alvin Deschler. This was their original meeting place. And it's clear that poor Al has been waiting there for a while by himself. According to IMDb, this was filmed um, on Encinal Canyon Road in Malibu. And there is not a junkyard listed there anymore but if you go on google maps you can still see that this clearly there are a ton of abandoned cars and there's definitely some junk on this piece of property if you do like a google maps overhead sat or satellite view did you ever go in a junkyard yeah i did actually yeah you know i used to have a i'm i think i probably mentioned this before but i used to have a 1967 volkswagen bus Mm-hmm. The split window. Copied dead. Yeah, w- yes, of. exactly. Following in my parents' <laughs> footsteps. Um, there was a camper version. And this was not really a vehicle. This was like a money pit. It was just, it was like I needed a car just to get things for my car. Like that was the only reason I needed this <laughs> thing. And so, yeah, I went to junkyards to try to find pieces. Um, but not very often. I think I went once or twice. Did you see any hobos there when you were there? Yes, I saw I saw Thomas Dolan. 
He came out of his car and he was like, I thought I heard a sound. Oh, oh Vito Scotty. <laughs> yeah. There was a junkyard in Munich um, next to AFES, the, the, the PX center, where you could get food. And then they had like, I think clothes and grocery store probably. Next to that, there was like a forest behind Munich American Elementary and Munich American High School, which was connected. Behind that were some woods and like a baseball field. But behind that, even further down, was a junkyard. And I went in there, uh, I think at least once, and it was so much fun. Like, it was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I don't think I was in there long because I'm probably afraid. But I just remember how magical, like, you could just, like, open the car doors. and Yeah. I don't, I don't think I was breaking anything. You probably were. But, um, you probably caused a lot of damage. I, I could have. I could have. I remember climbing the high school, like, climbing on top of the school one time in Munich. But um, oh, anyway, well, no. You, yeah, I was just curious about that. You are incriminating yourself left and right. I don't know if you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have some true crime fans. Well, some PC, the, 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 the. The MPs from Munich, if they're still, if any of them are re- not retired yet, I don't think there's a, there's there's no uh, base there anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, it's gone. Pretty sure. Well, I think we should bring back the junkyard because it's a pretty magical place. I mean, I know they still exist, but we should just make a habit of dropping our children off at junkyards more often. <laughs> <laughs> to meet the dog or to meet. Thomas Dolan. Yeah, they can have encounters with Dolan, random Rottweilers, Rusty, a lot of Rusty Metal. I thought you were really saying like there was a friend of yours named Thomas Dolan that was there like chilling out. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think I know There Thomas. was. He is a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Okay. So anyhow, we're at the junkyard. We made it. And, and Al's been waiting and he says, oh, I was worried about you. And Galesco says, oh, someone's kidnapped my wife. And um, this is the one moment where I feel like they should have given Don Gordon a couple of takes because he says, oh, somebody's got your wife. And then Deschler asks Galesco if he thinks if he might know who did it. And Galesco says, I'm afraid it's going to have to look like you. So he kills Al and then he shoots himself in the leg and then he um stumbles back to his car and that's when thomas dolan pops out of his car this is played by vito scott vito scotty a recurring columbo character he's in six other episodes of columbo we've definitely talked about him before he's great he has a great range because in this episode he's playing a very sloppy drunk a homeless person and then we see him, he's like a snobby, you know, uh, fancy men's store owner. He plays the wine, uh, or not the wine connoisseur, the maitre d' at a very snooty restaurant in another episode. And the, and the funeral director in the Swan Song, he's kind of a pushy salesman. He's just, he's, he's fun to watch. Absolutely. Yeah, he's so good. So... Vito, he, so so um, Galesco was not expecting there to be a witness, um, but you know, thankfully, he he's this man's clearly very intoxicated, and I I tried to figure out what car, what Dolan's car slash home was. It looks like it might be an old Ford Econoline van, but I am not sure. So if any listener knows. The make and model of Dolan's car. I would love to know. It's like, I don't even think it's on wheels anymore. It's a broken down van. um, No. With a flat nose, flat nose van. Anyhow, (laughs) (laughs) I went down a little rabbit hole, like looking at all the old flat nose vans, um, going off headlights and windshield. I couldn't figure it out. Anyhow. Galesco gets out of there, and and now Columbo is finally on the scene. The scene of the crime is the junkyard. You know, we know that Mrs. Galesco's dead, but the story, the rest of the story doesn't know that yet. Like, the, the cops don't know that yet. So Columbo arrives at the junkyard, and the Peugeot is barely making it up the hill. And this is one of the many great moments in this episode where an officer says, go back, go back. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because he thinks 
Columbo's trying to drop off his junker car and his car stalls. So Col- the Peugeot stalls out near the bottom of the hill. So Columbo hoofs it up to Sergeant Hoffman, who was the first person on the scene. And Hoffman explains to Columbo what's happened here, that Galesco's wife was kidnapped. Desher was the kidnapper. Galesco showed up with the cash. And then Galesco killed Deschler. And Columbo is immediately thrown off by this piece of information that Deschler was murdered before Paul found out where his wife was. And then Columbo meets Dolan, the homeless person, un- unhoused person is what we say, Paul. And Dolan says he wants to give a statement, but he wants to give it downtown. So Columbo says, take him downtown, take his statement, make sure he's got a a meal and a place to sleep. And Dolan is very grateful. It's another great little moment between the two of them. I like the junkyard scene. I, I One of the things I love about this episode is all of these different lo- filming locations, you know, and there's a lot of uh, outside filming locations. It's fun. I liked it. Yeah, no, the characters in this too, um, the director was the guy who did the... Uh, the one we didn't give good review, the the futuristic the one with the robot and the little kid. But this director, he he was from he's from Sweden. Um, he yeah he and the team and everybody. It's this this one was is is excellent. Like it's it's because like the Sergeant Hoffman who's out there, he's great. Like who's yeah. this guy? You know, he's got lots of lines. The 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 guy, the cop who doesn't want Columbo to come up. He, his reaction is really good. Sort of just still like, why are you okay? You're a lieutenant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of great, um, you know, extra actors or extra performers in this episode. They, they bring, really bring, really bring it to life. You know, Columbo decides he should probably go see Galesco who got shot in the leg. He's at the hospital. He's going to make it. So Columbo heads to the hospital and Galesco is, laying on a table, getting his leg wound treated. Galesco says he thinks his wife is dead because of the way Deschler came at him. And Columbo notices the the gun powder, the gun residue on Galesco's pants. And so that's another piece of information that, you know, Columbo's collecting. And he asks Galesco to explain what happened. And Galesco basically repeats the same story that he's already shared about getting the let taking his wife to the auction, et cetera, et cetera. So now we, I'm pretty sure that the hospital, that was a studio set, I, I think. So now we head to Deschler's motel because the cops have figured out where he was staying and the sun has set, and I really like that they did this sort of night shoot or evening shoot because I feel like we don't see very many of those with Columbo. I wonder if Peter Falk did not want to do night shoots. If <laughs> he was like, well, I think that's I think that's a day for night shot though. I think it's shot during the day. Oh, really? Because it looks dark. It, but I mean, I know the moon can cast shadows, but it it, it has sort of a just looking at it. It looks like they toned down the gamma or whatever on the okay. on the film stock when they okay you say so i thought it was a night no I, me- I remember thinking that i could be wrong it could be the moon no you know you know better than I sh- me i i take your word for it paul william Kronhager, william is the cinematographer 1930 to 1995 yeah he so he's an old school camera operator anyway yeah i, I imagine that that was the, in the day well, it looks like so. So they're back in at the hotel or the motel, I should say, and they're actually in Deschler's hotel room. And it looks like they filmed this in the actual motel room. Mm-hmm. And so this is where there's so much evidence incriminating Gale- uh, Deschler here in the room. You know, like we mentioned already, like, mm-hmm. you know, they find the camera, the glue, the scissors, the newspaper, and we meet the manager of the motel. He was a 
Mike Lally. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this guy was fun, though. I mean, he didn't have a lot of lines, but I thought he did a good job. Yeah. And the manager says that Deschler reported his camera stolen. So it's odd that the camera is now back in the motel room. That's another little tidbit for Columbo that he's collecting. And in addition to all that physical evidence, we also learn that Deschler used the phone to call Galesco at 10 a.m. on the, you know, the day before, like, just like Galesco reported. So things are not looking good for Deschler. It's like mm -hmm. all the pieces are lined up against him here. Um, did you the, the actor who played the manager, his picture on his IMDb is from ah, Columbo. <laughs> I wonder if this was, did he do any other work? Or I wonder if this was his big role, maybe. Um, yeah, he kept busy. He was he like roles similar. Barnaby Jones, he was in five episodes of that. Um, but, uh, but usually like mechanic or doctor, bartender, garage man. But yeah, he'd been doing stuff since the, since 1950. Oh, wow. So he was he was busy. Mm -hmm. he, he had a lot of credits, yeah. Well, all all pretty small, but this might have been one of his favorites, yeah. you know. I mean, how could it not, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. So so we're done at the motel, and in the next scene, Columbo is back at the police department. It's the next morning, and Hoffman shows up for work and tells Columbo he could use some sleep and a shave. Columbo's been there all night. Columbo's been looking into Deschler's background, finds his conviction for extortion. But Columbo says, you know, um, Hoffman is so confused. Why, why are you spending so much time on this case? It's an open and shut case. This man is clearly guilty. And Columbo points out, he says, do you see anything in there that says Deschler is stupid? Because there were there were too many clues left behind. So Columbo is, is not satisfied with this case. Um, and while they're at the police station, they get a phone call that they found Mrs. Galesco dead at the ranch house. So now we head back to the ranch. Somehow Hoffman let Columbo drive him in the Peugeot. I kind of find that, <laughs> I kind of find that hard to believe. But so Columbo and Hoffman head out to the ranch house. Galesco is right behind in his own car, pulls up very upset and um, says he wants to ride with her in the ambulance. And now we move into the ranch. I think the inside of the ranch was probably a studio shoot. It had that yeah. feeling. I think I, when I saw this last, I remember thinking that as yeah. well. The fireplace and yeah. everything. Yeah. And so we meet the realtor here who sold the house to Deschler, who was actually purchasing it for Galesco. His name is Magruder. And this guy has a, has a multiple, I mean, I didn't look him up, but, but it looks like he's a, pro a professional actor. He's done a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was the, the, uh, in Beverly Hills oh, cop. He was, and he was a midnight run with Robert De Niro. He was great. He's always really good. And he was the dad in um, some kind of wonderful with Eric. He played Eric Stoltz's dad. And when I first saw him, when mom took me to see Beverly Hills cop, I loved, I thought it was great. I loved him. And uh, I, I, I haven't seen, you know, a lot of his work, but every time I've seen him, I'm just like, Oh man, he's good. Midnight run. He was really good. He was like, a bounty hunter like Robert De Niro. And I think they were both going after the same person. So they were competing against each other. So they kind of have this sort of, yeah, he was in, she's having a baby curly Sue. So, so, so some John Hughes stuff. Um, but yeah, this, this might've been his first gig. One of his oh, first wow. gigs. That's yeah. Cool. It wasn't his first one, but, but yeah, he was in uh, emergency and Kojak before that. And then a movie called an eye for an eye. But yeah, he stayed. He's still working. He's still working. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's great. Yeah, he was in uh, Lonesome Soldier this year. I don't know if it's even out yet. Well, he's in Gone Baby Gone. Uh, I don't remember him in that, but that was good. Uh, I, I I really liked it. I've only seen it once, but uh, only once. Uh, yeah, he's been. Heck? He's yeah. <laughs> 
but that's one I would see again. Like I remember just it stood out, you know, and I don't remember the whole story, but it was like really well done. I mean, I have a lot of those, yeah. but oh, he was in Jag, Liz. <gasps> Jag. He's so good. I was just noticing him. Um, he doesn't have a ton of lines, but he just uh, like there's this one little thing where he's like talking to them and I think he's like smoking a cigarette and then he kind of like tucks in his shirt and straightens out his pants. He just like. Mm -hmm. All those small little, those small little things he does that that um, make him more believable and just give his character a little bit more interest. You know, it's not just mm -hmm. like standing still reciting his lines. He, you know, he's yeah. You can tell he's vibrant. Like there's a lot going on. Like the 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 the, the uh, guy who drove there, Sergeant Hoffman. You know he's he's a veteran of acting. He's calm and cool, and he's keeping his role intact. And here's Peter Falk. You doing a scene with Peter yeah. Falk? <laughs> the uh, the forensics guy is really good oh, too. Oh yeah, Fred Draper. Yeah, yeah he's yeah we've talked. Oh, that's yeah, Fred Draper. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's great. He's in six six or seven episodes of Columbo. You're talking oh, about wow. the fingerprint oh. tech, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does a good job too. Yeah. So many great actors in this one, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and they all got to work with Peter Fox. Oh my gosh. One after the other. So a couple other important pieces of information come to light in this scene. Columbo, his eyes go to that clock, which was in the photo. It was in the ransom photo in the background yeah. behind um, Mrs. Galesco with the time, you know, establishing an alibi or whatever. And so his eyes go to the clock and he realizes that the clock does not have a, a layer of dust on it like everything else. So that's weird. And then he also asks uh, Mr. Magruder, the realtor, if he thought maybe Deschler was buying this house for someone else. And Magruder says, you know what? That's what I was thinking because of the fact that he was taking, a taking photos everywhere we went and I couldn't pin him down. So now we have a little more information here. Columbo has a few more clues here to support his suspicions that this is not as cut and dry as it, you know, as it appears. And it's weird though. Why, why do you think uh, Paul Galesco crumpled up the photos and threw them in the fireplace? He didn't like it. Oh, right. I didn't mention that. That's another important clue. But why would he leave them? Because he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> To give Columbo another clue. No, he's not an idiot. Here's the thing. He is narcissistic, right? He has this ego where he just thinks that he is yeah. so much smarter than Full everyone proof. else, right? He's like, no one's going to notice this. I'm I'm a genius, you know? Yeah. It's his own ego. And, th and that comes into play later as well, uh, multiple times, uh, two more times that comes into play where his ego gets him in trouble because he thinks, mm -hmm. you know, he can't perceive that he has any flaws or shortcomings. Um, like Columbo. You're a little flawed, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's a great line. That's why they put it in the beginning. Right. It is a great line. For the cold open. I should have typed that line out. I didn't type it out. I love typing out some of the little, the little tidbit, the little um, couplets uh, or even just the single single lines that, that are really good um okay but paul are you ready for one of my favorite scenes yeah all right it's a great shot too so good we are going to check in with thomas dolan we're going to the soup kitchen and i the filming location for this is known as indian alley so the filming location for the alley so colombo is walking down an alley and this was filmed at a spot called Indian Alley that, Paul, you could actually visit if you wanted to. There's a bunch of really beautiful murals in this alley. And there's a little bit of history behind it, which I found from um, an article on losangelesbeat.com. So the official name of this alley is Worden Place. And in the 1960s, a lot of Native Americans were displaced from their lands. and came to Los Angeles 
And this alley, according to this article on Los Angeles Beat, was a place where many Native Americans who were unhoused spent a lot of time. And uh, according to the article, um, you know, they were struggling, they were suffering. There were some substance abuse problems happening in this general vicinity. And a Catholic mission was there as well. The saint, probably the one that, the, the name that we see was probably the actual mission. It's it's called St. Matthew Mission. I couldn't, I tried to find out if that was the actual mission at the time, but there was a Catholic mission right at the end of this alley. And then there was also a nonprofit formed in one of the buildings adjoining this alley to serve the unhoused Native Americans who were there. Um, and so now it's called Indian Alley, and all of the murals or many of the murals commemorate that time where they were losing their land and being displaced to Los Angeles and other places. Anyhow, but in this scene, we don't see that. We see Mike Lally sitting on the ground in the mm-hmm. alley. It's a great moment there. And Columbo's trying to find the mission. And Mike Lally points him to the mission. Um, Oh, this alley, by the way, has been in a lot of other movies and TV shows, including The Sting, Beretta, Hill Street Blues, Police Story, Quincy M.E., and Starsky and Hutch. Okay. And if you go to visit, it might actually be in use for other movies because it's a pretty popular filming location. Yeah, we've driven. uh, St. John had, had worked at the downtown women's shelter. And so occasionally I would go down there with her to get something or to return something. Um, and we didn't drive directly. We were like a block down from there, you know. But I'm just yeah, looking at that area now. And, uh, yeah, there's so many things down there. Yeah, there's a bunch of cool things down there. I mean, the murals, I think, would be amazing to visit. Next time I'm, I'm down there, Paul, we'll have to go see the murals. But then there's also yeah. some um, – There it looks like there's some – kind of art galleries or yeah hauser and worth is downtown now uh, which is you know they have galleries all over the world it used to be a bread factory and they have you know it's free to look at what they're offering up you know but they have some pretty cool stuff in there uh, but there's a lot of stuff around there but uh, yeah all over you yeah there's all these different areas to be explored, to get stuff, you know, like there's the, there's flower, the flower district kind of where they have a lot of fresh flowers in the mornings mm-hmm. and then beads, you know, oh, yeah. uh, mom get beads at some of these places where that's all they have, you know, like right. tons and tons of these. <laughs> so cool. Uh, this, the, 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 um, you know, clothing, the clothing stuff, you know, there's so much stuff, but yeah, it's a great shot. It's a little, it looks like a movie, you know, mm-hmm. that's that shot with Lally on the ground. Yeah, very cinematic. What's he doing with his eyes? Like he's there's no sun yeah. in his eyes, but he's like <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Mike sure Kelly's sitting on the ground. He's got his hand up in front of his face, like he's blocking the sun, but there is no sun. I don't know. He was just he was in the moment, Paul. He was in the yeah. Moment. And there's a guy leaning against the wall across from him no, I didn't with, with his arms him. against the wall. I didn't see him. Yeah. So Columbo goes into St. Matthew's Mission. I'm pretty sure this was actually filmed in the mission. This does not look like a studio. This looks like an actual no. location. Yeah, it looks like a scene from a Cassavetes film for a moment. Yeah. And <laughs> I love all of the background characters in this scene. The, the opening shot is a man holding a spoon like way up near the end. And um, anyhow, it's it's great. There's a lot of uncredited actors or performers in this scene and they are listed as derelicts. They're probably, some are probably not actors. Did you say that? <laughs> no, but I'm guessing that they might have actually yeah. been clients of the mission. But we also see, oh, I forgot to write down her name, but we also see an actress who's been in other Columbos here. Is it uh, Joyce Van Patten? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she's so she's good. She's so good. So she's a nun. She helps run the mission and she sees Columbo coming in, you know, tired, hasn't shaved. And she says, welcome, brother. My house is your house. And Columbo's just kind of nodding and 
saying, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. I'm okay. <laughs> she says, you're hungry and tired. I can see that. So yeah. Go ahead. You go, Paul. Um, I, I always felt like, I remember always loving this scene because it's like, you know, you know, people mistake him for <laughs> you know, a homeless guy. But and like on this time, on this time watching it, I enjoyed it again. But I almost, I wondered how much they could improvise because I felt they were on top of their game. Like it was almost like a competition. She was kind of outdo him before he could say anything. And she just kept going, but. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I wonder. But I mean, who knows, you know, but it's so, I loved yeah. it. Because she's almost like steely and almost obnoxious about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little not as, um, she's still gracious and come in, brother. Mm -hmm. But this this is where uh, uh, Vito adds a, yet another great layer to his performance. Mm -hmm. Now he's sober. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of rude, but also kind of gentlemanly and kind of professory and <laughs> all these things. He's so good. He's he, Yeah, he's so good. There's a moment, Columbo walks in and you he's he's scanning the room to find Dolan. And, and then the camera finds Dolan and Dolan does this scratching on his cheek, you mm -hmm. know, just like this <laughs> big scratches across his beard or you could just like picture someone who hasn't shaved for a while might do like at home and they're on their, in their recliner or something, you know, <laughs> just like, Rah. I don't know. It's funny. It's a funny little moment. You think I should get that look kind of like, cause I am balding, but like have my hair kind of go across. Yeah. You think I should do Absolutely, that? Absolutely, Paul. And just have a big mustache? Yes. You should do it. Okay. <laughs> or I, I do like Dick Van Dyke's it. beard. St. John would love it. Oh, yeah. I do like Dick Van Dyke's beard. What did you think of his beard? How he shaves? Yeah. like the I was side. wondering, when did his hair turn gray? Because he must have been like uh, 25 when his hair turned gray. Because it is like... Kind of like Leslie Nielsen, yeah. <laughs> Like everything he's ever been in, he's had gray hair and he's been acting forever. Mm -hmm. Still doing stuff, still around. That's, uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw, um, I forget where I saw this, but Dick Van, New Orleans. Dick Van Dyke was like leaving his gym in Los Angeles and the paparazzi oh. got a photo of him. I was like, man, there he is. He's still at it. Yeah. Okay. Back to the mission, back to the soup kitchen slash mission. Um, lots of people are enjoying their beef stew. So this is where we get our snack from, Paul. They're enjoying beef stew in their metal bowls, yes. with their metal spoons. And next to the beef stew is um, a hamburger bun, not toast, a bun, just a plain old bun, mm -hmm. kind of an. But you have to imagine, like, yeah, I can see that happening. Sometimes a soup kitchen might not yeah. get to decide exactly what they're going to serve, right? So exactly. A very realistic. Yeah. Beef stew in a bun. That's what you get. And that's what we had as well in solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. We're, we are very much privileged here. Um, True. Columbo sits down with Dolan and the nun uh, played by, I don't think we learned her name, played by Joyce. Joyce Van Patten. Oh, Sister of Mercy is what it says on IMDb. Yeah, but that's, I mean, she must have a name. Anyhow, she comes around with a new coat for Columbo. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, what is she saying? We're not modest here or something like that. Oh, my gosh. She says so many good things. She is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I, I meant to watch this Elvis movie she was in, Trouble with Girls, I believe she was in. She was in a, one of the writers of Columbo, Larry Cohen, uh, this, you know, did some of the stories. He did a movie called bone, which I, I tried to watch the whole thing. That was tough. Um, it's, it was very, it was good. It was very original, but there's some, you know, stuff in it's, I won't go into detail, but she's the lead, one of the leads, but this episode of the Rockford files, I forget the name of it, but if you look her up and you find out, the episode she's in, 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 in Rockford Files, that episode was was really good. It was, it was a, little, uh, a little different ups and downs. But her character in particular was 
so interesting and funny and sort of sad in some ways too. And um, I'm looking at IMDb now, trying to see what that Rockford Files was. Um, but take a look. Oh, she's oh she's th- she's in two episodes. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's the same. It's like a two parter to protect and serve, part one and part two. Um, and the way they ended that, like it, it was. It was it was made for a very different Rockford Files. It reminded me of Hill Street Blues in the seriousness of of her character, and she just brought something completely different, like sort of sort of a troubled sort of person in a way, um, but but funny too. Like you just think she's sort of a funny sort of character, but it um, uh, anyway. Yeah, she's great. She's great. If you can check that out. That you could see her her range. Yeah. Well, she's in another Columbo. She's in. Is she in just one other Columbo? I can't recall. But it, she's in um, Old Fashioned Murder, which we haven't discussed yet. And she plays a... Is that a new one? Or from this... Ver- from this, from uh, this era. Boot? Yeah, this era. Oh, good. Yeah. but And she just plays a very different person. She's very serious. She does not smile a lot. So even just... If you don't... I mean, I think we should definitely... We'll include the Rockford... Like hopefully people check her out on Rockford Files, but even if you only see her on her, only even if you only see her on Columbo, you can tell that she's got a really great range. Um, because yeah, when we see her again, she's she's very different. Yeah, her brother is Dick Van Patten from Eight Is Enough. Oh wow! The, the dad, another really good actor. Wow. She played uh, Sean Penn's mom in. Falcon and the Snowman, which is a very interesting film based on the real life Thomas Boyd. I forget his name. He was a he sold his he worked at a highly classified place and um, but yeah, I, I'd hope to see more of her in the film. And she's she's only like she's in very few scenes. But I didn't I didn't finish watching it again. Like I'd seen it when I was in high school, and I meant to watch it again. Oh uh, come on, man! What the heck? I know, I know. I ran out of time. You gotta watch, Ran out you of have time, to watch everything. Liz. Everything with everyone. Ignore work, ignore the kids, <laughs> ignore my wife. No more sleeping. <laughs> no more sleeping. No more. <laughs> oh, man. Well, okay, so excellent moment. Um, there are a couple of pieces for the plot here uh, that Dolan does not recall his statement at all, but in it, he said that there was a time lapse between the first shot at the junkyard and the second shot, which would go against Galesco's statement where he said, everything happened so fast. I I had no time to, you know, he shot me and I immediately shot him back or shot, shot back at him, whatever. So Columbo was really hoping to get that verified and Dolan cannot help him because he doesn't remember anything, but yeah, such a fun, such a fun moment. A lot of great things happening there. It's it's worth watching just that scene. You know, if you don't have time for anything else in your day, just queue up that scene and watch it. <laughs> at the at the soup kitchen. Soup kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my advice. We're going to go back to Galesco's house, Paul. Are you ready? Okay, you, let's do ready? it. How are we getting there? Scooter? We're going to scooter over. You- it's, you get, can't go too fast, though, because at the red lights, it's very dangerous if you just <laughs> go straight through, like I've noticed some young people doing oh, lately. Yes, I know. Don't get me started on these kids these days and their e-bikes. So Columbo's at Galesco's home. He's in his living room by himself. I have to imagine that Mrs. Moylan must have let him in. And asked him to wait there for Galesco, but we don't see that. He is realizing, so he's looking at Galesco's books and he realizes that he needs an ashtray for his cigar. He can't find one, so he ashes into his pocket 
and then tamps tamps down the ashes. Meanwhile, Galesco has has quietly entered the room and is observing all of this. Yeah, it's great because he's just kind of like staring at him like, what is, what is he doing? What is wrong with you? And you have to imagine, Paul, how much that jacket must smell mm-hmm. after you put cigar ashes into the pocket. Ugh. I want. I wanted to find out uh, at Dick Van Dyke on Columbo. I didn't do too deep a dive, but I've been reading his autobiography and I watched, I went online to watch some of the um, television Academy stuff with Dick Van Dyke. Oh yeah. In shooting Columbo, Canning's book, he does mention that they wanted him for another Columbo later on again. And he said, I think they reached what his, his amount he wanted, but I think he also said, I didn't want, I don't want to play second fiddle to Peter Falk. Oh, interesting. Um, but I wondered if he, if he felt, uh, you know, that a little uh, ego competition going on with this. I don't know. I mean, that's just a guess, but I wonder why he doesn't talk about Columbo because it was, he's so good in it. He's, he's, and he's, he's, he's against character in this, you know, he, he did play an alcoholic before this in like a TV movie and he got good reviews and that's part of the reason I think that they picked him for this. But, um, you know, he was always known as this goody two shoes in Hollywood. You know, it was in Disney movies and, you know, Dick Van Dyke show. He's, you know, a lot of comedy. But, uh, yeah, I, I wish I could, I, I should dig. I'll dig, dig deeper to see if I can find something else on what it was like working on Columbo. Yeah. Well, it's, it's too late now, Paul. When, when are you going to do that work? Well, we have other episodes too. I could bring it up. I could pretend I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of our show and write no, a letter. We can never discuss this again. This is your last. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is it. Okay. Then I you won, Liz. You defeated me. No, I'm just I kidding. Confess. No. I'm the murderer. <laughs> you keep saying Paul, and I keep th- thinking you're you're saying something to me. I'm trying to say Galesco and not Paul. <laughs> and I'm like, Galesco, Deschler. Oh, you, know, uh. you know what's kind of weird is like, I always, it makes me wonder, you know, makes me think about me. Like I was watching um, this, the girl, the lady from the X-Files, really good performer. Oh, yeah. Um, Jillian. Jillian Anderson. Uh, Anderson. There we go. She's great. Uh, she was in a show called The Fall and uh-huh. I started watching it. Just recently, it's it was out in 2013, and she she's a detective in Great Britain or from Scotland. I can't remember, but she the the killer is just like a serial killer who's married with kids, <laughs> and Ooh. and yeah, and it, his name is Paul. <laughs> uh oh. I, I was watching it. Else, it's kind of like because it's like Paul. Do you think this Paul? <laughs> I was like this, <laughs> and then I, and then I was watching another another series, like the same within the same week. It's the the bureau. I don't know if I've ever mentioned the bureau. I watched it a long time ago. It's a French series about the the intelligence agency in France, and uh, it's the the boyfriend from Amelie. I forget his name. His name is Paul. <laughs> 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 and so it's kind of like uh, it just had me thinking, and you know, like. I don't know, it, was, it was a little unnerving in that fall one, you know, because it's mm-hmm. disturbing. It's very, there's some stupid stuff in it too, though. Like, I, I mean, I haven't studied, you know, killers and I've been writing some stuff about one for, for a film for a, based on a book, you know, so me and my writing partner. Um, but I've been wanting to research that to sort of get into, it's not one of the, it's not the main character, thank goodness, but it's one of the characters but to bring some more believability to the this, this story, I was going to research some, but I haven't yet just because it's kind of worries me a little bit, but, but watching that film, there's a lot of stuff where I was like, yeah, is that really, would that, is that realistic for this killer to be married and have kids? And um, so, some of the lines and stuff like just seemed, I don't know, I guess I'm going off on a tangent, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's what we do we'll, here. We'll, Paul. we'll pull it back. So anyway, come back. say Galesco, will you? <laughs> I'm trying to say Galesco. <laughs> no, you can say Paul. 
it's fun. But yeah, a lot of these killers, they have wives and families like uh the long the Long Island uh murderer. Oh you yeah, know? yeah. Oh I'm yeah. sure. I, I I'm I am no doubt. I'm sure there's they did their work in that in the in the, the fall series, but yeah, just like the lady, the Ted Bundy uh the one who worked with him. She's like, that sure describes my friend that I work with. It couldn't be him. Yeah, I have some. I know someone named Ted who has that exact same car. Who looks sound looks looks but just sure like not him. him. <laughs> it couldn't be Ted. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, back to Galesco's home. I just want to point out a couple of pieces of decor, Paul, because you know, I like I like looking for those dog statues and cat <laughs> statues and. What have you? Um, Galesco has a, a tower of lemons in his living room. I that. And I was like, what is this? It's like a ceramic sculpture of lemons in the shape of a small tower or tree. And apparently this was a thing in it for a while. This was, they, they call it ceramic. So online I found ceramic lemon topiary. Oh, I see. It's in the corner over there. In the corner. You could get one of these uh, today, anywhere from one fifty to eight hundred dollars. So, kind of, kind of fancy now. And there's an interesting portrait of a young woman in a dress made of flowers. It's interesting. He doesn't have any of his uh, photos up in the living room. That's true. Well, that's because of his another, wife, right? Yeah, could be because of Francis. Ruining there's everything another, for him. <laughs> ruining his life. There's another floral couch, but it's not the ones from the past. This one's basically just shades of white or tan or something. Anyhow, Columbo starts rambling on about photography. Galesco cuts him off, says, I'm tired. And Columbo brings up Dolan's statement about the time lapse between the two gunshots. And Galesco writes that off, says that man was super drunk. Yeah. Oh, Colombo, yeah, Colombo mentions the powder burns on Galesco's pants, and Galesco says, "Oh, well, you know, we got into a tussle," and and he sort of revises, adds more details to his description of the murder, mm-hmm. and and then Colombo, Colombo is like, "Okay, I'm gonna head out. I gotta go get my dog," and. Or go check on my dog. I forget exactly what he says. But then he asks Galesco for if he has a photo of a cocker spaniel because his dog is missing the neighbor's <laughs> cocker spaniel. <laughs> yeah. That one's a little, that was a little, yeah. I, I think he was like, let's, let me mess with this jerk or something, you know? Exactly. I mean, that's what he does, right? He has to push buttons and mm-hmm. see what happens he's he's trying to understand how these people tick yeah and so this is one of those moments where he's like let's see what happens if i yeah yeah do this <laughs> yeah let's just throw a t- tomato on the wall and see what happens see if he gets mad do you have a picture of a dog do you take pictures of have. Dog? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, i wonder if he like that if that was improvised that feels like it must have been scripted. That was a a lot. Yeah. To improvise. Yeah, Peter but. Fisher did this one. Great job. Yeah, it was really well written. Okay, so Columbo heads out to uh the camera shop now where Deschler purchased the camera he used to photo houses but also to photograph Francis Galesco. And this was filmed in Toluca Lake in Los Angeles. It might still this building might still be there. It's hard to tell. It looks like there might be a nail spa and a psychic in the spot that used to be the camera shop now. It's on Riverside Drive. Oh, what's the address? In Toluca Lake. Uh, 10053 Riverside Drive in Toluca Lake in Los Angeles. This guy was really good too. The camera shop owner or employee, Columbo goes to him to find out about the camera that they found in Deschler's room. He wants to know who bought it. Camera shop guy says, yeah, it was the man in that photo. He bought it. And Columbo learns that Al took a cab there. And the cab was outside waiting for him on the curb. 
And Al Deschler asked the camera shop person to make the receipt out for more as though he was going to get reimbursed by somebody. So Colombo gets even more information that Deschler is clearly not working alone. Like there's somebody else behind the scenes here. Colombo also learns that you can flip a photo around to make what the camera shop guy calls a reverse negative. That was great how he reacted. He said, oh, really? You can do that? Is that right? <laughs> I'll, be a, I'll be a monkey's uncle. <laughs> That's what he says. So we have even more clues. Columbo's pile of clues is huge at yeah. this point. There's so much incriminating someone besides Deschler. And, and now we're going to go to a funeral at Inglewood Park Cemetery. <laughs> he just, Columbo turns it up in this scene. Oh my gosh. He thought the portrait for his dog was bad. <laughs> yeah. This is pretty bad. Which is a little tough on the people who had nothing to do with the murder, you know, like right? it's a little unethical. Like her, like her sister <laughs> or, like... you know. A little unethical. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that would never happen. Uh, this um, filming location is actually in two other Columbos, Murder Under Glass and Columbo Goes to the Guillotine. So we'll get to those in the future. It's also in a lot of other films and TV shows. It's not in Ransom for a Dead Man? No, I think that was a different cemetery. Um, but I don't remember the name of it. But yeah, not this one. I love, yeah, so Colombo is <laughs> – oh, go ahead. I love how he's clicking and, and uh, Paul Galesco is kind of like looking around for the click. like where. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah Colombo is a clear disturbance. He's there with a the camera. <laughs> he's taking photos. Not the lieutenant's finest moment. <laughs> it's like a quiet, like sad, somber funeral ceremony. And then you hear this little click, <laughs> click. Yeah, Paul Galesco definitely notices. Um, I think a couple other people notice. And um, I just wanted to say that Lorna, the photo assistant, looks amazing. Green hat. She has this wide brim green felt hat and a dress with like green and black and flowers. And little, she's missing a glove, Paul. She has on one black glove. <laughs> I need to know what happened to her other glove. Maybe she took it off to oh, shake it's in her hands. hand. It's in her I, hand. You can see it. Why isn't she wearing it? I, I don't, don't understand. There's a lot of short gloves in this scene. And I think we need to bring back the short gloves. Okay. I don't, Did you ever I don't know how gloves? we're going to. Yeah, I have. I, I wore gloves to my high school prom. Oh, like white gloves? They were black? Yeah, white gloves. Yep. What about the But uh, I don't wear Go ahead. I don't wear them anymore. Oh. And I need to I need to somehow find a way to wear them on a more regular basis. Like a Prince concert. <laughs> Prince passed away, Paul. Come on, man. She was in she was the lead as Isis in The Secrets of Isis, that actress who plays uh, uh, Joanna Cameron's her name. Yeah, she did. I don't. I think she did acting for a while and then she got out of it. But she was in one movie that I rented, but I didn't watch it, called Pretty Maids All in a Row, and uh, it's it's Rock Hudson, Roger Roger the Vadim, the French director, um, did it. It's got all these interesting things to it, but um, I knew what it was about. And it was like California State Police Captain Sam Searcher investigates a string of teenage girl murders at Oceanfront High School. So, Ooh, like, dark. yes, yeah, so every night I was like, nah, I don't really want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially it's from the 70s, you know. So there's no telling yeah. what you're going to see or hear. Um, yeah. Good call. Good call. <laughs> but I, I heard, I heard, I think it got good reviews, but uh, it's a comedy crime. So I don't know, but she's in it. 
Um, well, she was fun to watch. I thought. I thought she did a great job. Mm-hmm. Me too. She she was very like natural, kind of believable, relaxed, not overacting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Yeah. She had a good style, just sort of believable, and I think you, and you could feel like her keeping her how she felt about him under wraps in a way, even though you could still kind of see it, you know, peeping out um, concern for him when Columbo would come by. Didn't she, she, she had a little bit of that, right? Yeah. It comes up in a later scene where she, she's protective. Mm -hmm. So, so a couple of things happen at the funeral or the, the, the um, graveside, you know, ceremony. Lorna tells Galesco, you know, he says she's at peace now, Lorna. And Lorna says, um, and so are you. Mm -hmm. And he says that was uncalled for. And she says, I just won't be a hypocrite. I know what she did to you. Mm -hmm. And at that very moment, Columbo, I think maybe he clears his throat or something. So Columbo clearly overhears yeah. that exchange um and colombo wants to talk to galesco again and he wants to talk about the time gap between the shots fired also there's a big time gap between when galesco said he was going to meet up with deschler um according to what mrs moyland heard and when the 911 call came in because, as we know, Galesco went to Deschler's motel room and then to the junkyard. Um, but Galesco says, oh, I was directed to a phone, phone booth um, first and then to the junkyard. But he didn't write down the address of the phone booth. So, again, Columbo is very suspicious. Mm -hmm. And he says, if it was me... And it was my wife. Yeah, I would have, I would have written that down. Yeah. Okay, so we're back in the police department, and we're in the evidence room, and Columbo bumps into his captain, who says, "Columbo, what are you doing down here in the dungeon?" Yeah. Columbo says he's working on the Deschler case, and the captain says, "I thought that case was closed because there is so much evidence against Deschler." Columbo says, you know what bothers me? This guy's always driving around in cabs. And Columbo figures out that Deschler didn't have a driver's license, which is why he was using cabs, and that he had to get a driver's license in order, you know, before the kidnapping, quote unquote, kidnapping happened. And he finds uh, Deschler's driver's license and sees that he did get it. The morning of the kidnapping, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> I mean, that feels like that should be a strong enough case against Deschler right there. But um, he still needs to keep building his case. But he has another very important piece of information here. So now we're going to go check on Lorna and Galesco at Galesco's photo studio, which has red carpet and pink walls. <laughs> <laughs> very it's interesting a, chandelier very interesting i think his wife decorated yeah. that right yes probably francis decorated it she likes red clearly and pink because their living room is pink um and columbo's chatting with lorna and columbo notices that galesco has published a book of portraits from san quentin i meant to google if someone has published a book of portraits from san quentin or any federal prison but i ran out of time but i bet i bet they would be very interesting yeah um i don't know if you heard the f the photographer walker evans oh yeah i believe it's walker evans yeah i knew that you yeah, liked he, him yeah yeah i love walker evans. i love him yeah he does really beautiful portraits of people across the u.s he's done portraits of people who are in poverty and just captures you know different sides of life here in the u.s i bet he could do some interesting portraits of prisoners as well but someone in very fancy clothes is leaving the <laughs> leaving the, the studio i think i think he i think galesco says it's mrs charlesworth 
and she has some very feathery cuffs and a sequin shirt. One single black feather sticking up the back of her hair. (laughs) Um, And so Columbo gets into Galesco's interior studio space and he wants to show him some photos from the funeral. It's Grady Hunt, by the way. The costume designer. Okay. He did great. I think he took more risks this time than he has in the past. With different people? Just like more interesting clothes. Yeah. I like them more than some of the other ones. Although the last, the la- maybe it's this season he's sort of upping his game because the last episode there were some more interesting costumes too. Yeah. Anyhow, so Columbo shows Glasgow's shows Galesco the photos he took at the funeral looking for the accomplice. Galesco says, Lieutenant, these are the worst photos I've ever seen. And, but Columbo has also slipped the photo of Francis into his stack. Yeah. The one that he found in the ashes. Yeah. That's like that, that (laughs) there he just like threw everything off his desk. Yeah. He wanted to see it, but his react, but here, here, I think Paul Galesco's reaction it's weird. It's so calm and collected, you know? Yeah. It's almost like it goes to that arrogance thing, I guess. But part of me thinks like, why wouldn't he be like, pretend to be like, why are you, sh- why did you, how could you leave this in? You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden, like, you know, who do you think you are? Like insulted. You know what I mean? Yeah. As opposed to like, or, oh, my wife. Oh, okay. What's she doing in here? Why'd you put her in here? What's you know? this? But yeah, it's a little like, it's a little odd. I wonder if the if the director could have said something to him or yeah i don't know it's it's not the best like i don't i feel like the character wouldn't just be so blasé about it yeah cuz it's not even it doesn't even seem like he's i don't know it's just kind of odd it is odd because he knows how to act in, in other moments um when he shows up for francis's body he acts very emotional and upset in this moment, like you said, he's he's like, oh, how interesting. What's this? You know, where a normal person, <laughs> a normal person would be really upset. Like, oh, my gosh, there's more photos of my loved one when they were kidnapped. Yeah, who do you think like, you were, why did you, what is this doing in here? I don't know. What is this, a what sick is joke? This? You know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it, uh, and I think, I think this is his ego, like, um getting in the way of him making a good choice because he's he's feels invincible and like it doesn't matter how he re- I I just think he in this moment he thinks it doesn't matter mm-hmm. how he reacts or maybe he doesn't know how to react to a photo of her but- I don't I mean I just uh yeah that could be just like a big blind spot in his head I just I don't know maybe they, I would have had them do another take you know but maybe you know like the the director, that guy Alf, uh, K J E L L I N, um, yeah, maybe he missed that opportunity there. Yeah, and 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 I was also thinking that if Dick Van Dyke was having a tough time with Peter Falk and his terms of like how long they would go, and you know who knows what else is going on with Dick on a personal level, how he could have been over the scene, you know, over this moment, and like this, yeah. you know. I'm just going to give him this thing. We're going to move on, you know? Yeah. Um, I, on all accounts, I, I mean, he, he was on the Carol Burnett show, you know, like the last season he took Harvey Corman's place. And um, I think he, in his autobiography, he says he decided not to stay on, even though they wanted him to, but he just felt like he, he couldn't, he couldn't find his footing in that, um, you know, but he did so well with, you know, Carl Reiner and Dick Van Dyke show. And, and, um, Mom and Dad like the show where he's a detective. He's like a doctor. He did a series where he's a doctor with his son, his real life son. But anyway, yeah, it's I, I yeah I, I hear what you're saying. But I, I I was immediately struck as to like, wouldn't you react some way? But maybe you're right. Maybe he's just like, but it's like he's still professing his innocence, you know? Yeah. And it just seems like they could have done it better. I don't know. It is it is it is odd. It's definitely odd. Yeah. And then, um, so, and then Columbo, so then Columbo says, this is one of the, it's 
Columbo says, it's so weird that Deschler would have thrown this photo out because it's a perfectly good photo. So Columbo baits him into, you know, he can't resist. His ego cannot yeah. resist saying, like, this is a bad photo and here's why. But he kind of walks into that trap. Yeah. Again. Uh, and we'll see it again. But, it's with but, it, it, he, but um, they're talking about his wife. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It's like showing a, you know, your your, your loved one, yeah. you know, with the situation like, oh, well, you know, these kidnappers, they just don't know what they're doing. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. He clearly has a major blind spot. He's clueless about how to behave and and Columbo gets gets all that out he's you know he sees it's all out on display yeah he's yeah now now it's like yep this is my man mm -hmm. um so Columbo gets that piece of information and then he shares with Galesco about the newspaper in Destler's room how the maid said there was no newspaper um when she went to clean up the room and like you said the newspaper was just left out lying on the bed or the desk. I forget where it was lying. Anyhow, Galesco says the maid was probably lying yeah. about the newspaper. Well, obviously she's cover lying. Up her <laughs> yeah. Oh, so things are not, you know, the evidence is not stacking up well for Galesco here. And Columbo is on to him. And now Galesco's having a show of his photos in his I, I believe this is his publisher's space where he set up a whole bunch of um, Galesco's photos. A lot of different people come and Columbo comes and Dick Van Dyke does an excellent job of playing a, an annoyed person here when Columbo shows up. Wait, so this is a show of all the different photographers work or just, I think it's just Galesco's work. Yeah, I tried to find out who this the photographer was, but I think it's different photographers. Um, so there's like pictures of uh, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Sophia oh, wow. Loren. The Sophia Loren I could find on Star it was on uh, Al uh, Alamy A L A M Y. It's like um, what's the big camera? What's the museum dad likes on the hill? The the Getty. Yeah, so the Getty Foundation. Oh, yeah, the Getty. So they have a lot of they have like a stock of library, and they're they're really like turning into not letting any. And they're very they're eating up everything like a big amoeba with photographs and and and. Um, but I could only find the Sophia Loren ones online, and didn't say who the photographer was. Usually, when you click on those, it'll say who the photographer is. Yeah. For those, it was like Hollywood Archive something. Um. So it's like when Dick is first, when you first see him with his publisher, the photos behind him, that's all Sophia Loren at her Hollywood home in Beverly Hills. Oh, wow. Yeah. But then there's oh, like, good catch. Paul. Yeah. But then there's like bullfighting pictures and yeah, I was trying to I find out that. like who, yeah, who this photographer was. And I, I briefly looked on Columbo file. I didn't see anything. Someone on Reddit asked about who's that person in this one photograph. And, uh, but with the jazz artists and they were like, Oh, that's so-and-so I forget what they said, but. Oh, that's cool. You looked that up, Paul. Yeah. I, I was also wondering about who's in these photos and who really took these photos, but I did not take the time to try to get to the bottom of that. So. Well, it's, yeah, it's pretty sure it's uh well, Duke Ellington, you can see him leaning on the piano and then like looking to the side. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. Duke Ellington. Um, but there's, yeah, there's so many amazing photographers. It's just like you mentioned Walker Evans and uh, recently, recently somebody gave me, um, cause I love like Emmett Gowan. He was one of my favorite photographers. And there was this, this, uh, thing from San Francisco, maybe Oakland area. I'm not hundred percent sure, but, um, somebody gave this to me and, uh, hamburger eyes yeah. is the book that you're showing. Hamburger there. eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's excellent. Uh, it was like a zine with uh, photography and um, these different photographers. And there's a documentary that came out 
called Hamburger Eyes. Um, the editor, Lenny Messina, he also edited a, a documentary called Beautiful Losers, um, which is uh, has some similarities. Um, it's about different artists. But, um, but yeah, that book. And then Dad always had some really great books for the photography, you know, like these weird German mu- magazine compilation things. Do you remember those? Be like these, no, it was I don't like know. these thick books that he got, and there would be black and white photography. But yeah, definitely my love for photography came from Dad and all the pictures he would take, and then the books that he had. And yeah, they're just, and like trying to find who these photographers were, I just came upon all these other great photographers, you know. You go on Instagram, some of the people we follow are amazing photographers. It's just so incredible. Yeah, I mean, you have to imagine that they must have gotten permission for all the photos that that were displayed in the background, right? Yeah, I was wondering if it was like universal images or something like that. I, yeah. I looked that up and I, I found some Duke Ellington, Count Basie photographs of similarly, like they're in the studio, you know, recording, practicing or whatever. Um, but I didn't find those. Um, I found ones very similar and they, they could have been from the same time. I found one that, that was from a German, you know, like kind of like the Getty stock footage website, but it was called, um, I forget the name of it, but it had something very similar, like Duke Ellington or had his, had the same jacket, same white button down. And it looked like from the same session, but I could never find another photograph to match the ones that you see in Colombo. So, but I think back then things were looser, you know, there wasn't as much copyright as they have now, oh, okay. you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but there's, yeah, there's always different rules. There's like fair usage for like documentaries, but this isn't a documentary, but it's definitely this now wouldn't fly, you know, right. but, but maybe back then too, maybe, maybe there was some, some, uh, I don't know. It's a good, good question now. And you look at, cause it, it this whole episode has like when they go into his office, you see all the photos on the wall and the yeah. couch and stuff. Um, but yeah, like they, I guess whoever designed this one, but maybe it's on the Columbo file. Maybe I just didn't dig deep enough. Yeah. You need to go back. <laughs> He's got so many twists and turns on that website. You know, you look at one thing and another things pop up and, mm-hmm. and then you become interested yeah, in what they're writing about. And you forgot why you're even there. It's like, why was I here? Uh, once again, Paul. <laughs> what are we doing, Liz? Oh, we're recording. <laughs> what am I working on? Negative reaction, man. Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> yeah. Come on. The guy Bring from it around. Poppins and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> okay. So, so Columbo shows up. He wants to talk to Galesco. Galesco's like, oh, are you kidding me? And Ray's like, no, use my office. Yeah. Ray gets them to go out of the space. And and Columbo reveals, you know, you, I got your book about San Quentin. And you're there for seven weeks, sir. May I show you something? <laughs> there, <laughs> there are 10 photos of Deschler in his book. And Galesco says, how could I possibly remember one name out of hundreds that I photographed? And Columbo says, not his name, sir, his face. Your business is faces. And so Columbo's trying to point out, like, you knew this man. You met him before. You knew him. And he says, I won't deny, sir, that I have problems with this case. And Lorna has come into the office overheard this and she's a bit upset and she says hasn't come on lieutenant he's been through enough already so this is one of the moments where she's you know defending galesco she cannot see at all that he is not a good person um but galesco knows that colombo is on to him and you know he's in trouble <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah he's got a really intense look on his face Okay, Paul, are you ready for Mr. Weekly? Yes. Are you sure? This is the one sure? I mentioned before. <laughs> this is the one I mentioned before when I was when I was doing a rewatch of this before we did this podcast, and I was like, "This is an actor." 
Larry, Larry Scorch, is that his name? Yeah, or Storch. Or I Storch, forget. sorry. Yeah. I, I, I don't I actually, Is it Storch? Okay. Yeah, he did a bunch of interesting things. I, I didn't watch anything else he did. I want to, though, but yeah, he just, oh, he's so good in this. He's so good. So Columbo goes to meet Mr. Weekly, who is an employee of the DMV. Mr. Weekly took Deschler on his driving test the morning of the 20th. And Columbo needs to get, um, you know, a, a sworn statement or whatever that Deschler got his, uh, passed his test that morning. So he goes out. He's been trying to get a hold of Mr. Weekly. And he's trying to see him that day. The DMV person tells him that Weekly is stranded in the field. Someone's car had problems. So Columbo shows up on the street to help out Mr. Weekly. There's a f- lovely little scene happening in the background between yeah, a t- a tow truck driver and a woman with a big feathery pink hat. And he says, the tow truck driver says, I, I, you know, it, it's not gas you need. It's something else. And she says, I will not pay you $20 to tow my car. <laughs> I can't remember how much it costs, but, and Ms. poor Mr. Weekly is standing watching this happen. Columbo pulls up and I think someone needs to make a Mr. Weekly meme. <laughs> it's my lunch hour. I'm hungry, irritable. <laughs> and Columbo wants to try to help him out. Says, can I take you to your, op- to your office? And, um, yeah, Mr. Weekly's just amazing. So they get in Columbo's car and <laughs> Mr. Weekly's looking for the seatbelts. Seatbelts, <laughs> Lieutenant, where are they? <laughs> it's really fun to see Columbo get um, kind of put in his place a bit from somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I mean, it's not exactly what's happening because... This is just someone commenting on his car and his driving, not his, you know, professional career. But it is somebody with more authority and skill sort Mm of (laughs) coming down on Columbo. (laughs) Somebody of the law. He has a badge and everything. And he... He does not appreciate the car or the way that Columbo drives. And there's a great moment where, you know, Columbo's trying to get information from him as they're driving. Columbo's not the most careful driver. We know this from (laughs) multiple episodes. Yeah, he starts freaking out. (laughs) I I would freak out too. I had to do that with a friend of mine a couple weeks ago. He was driving me to Highland Park from Pasadena. And uh-huh. He, what happened? And, you know, it's not very far. He's just kind of going over into the right lane. And we're in the left lane. I mean, we're bo- the, the two lanes, we were in the lanes we were supposed to go. You could go in the right lane or, you know, it was two lanes to go one way. And But he was kind of creeping over to the other side. And I was like, hey, come over, man. You're, you're going off. <laughs> He's like, huh? What? I was like, oh, okay. All right, dude. We, would you, with your arm out, pull over. <laughs> pull yeah. over. Yeah. Pull over. <laughs> Weekly <laughs> says it like three or four times. Yeah. He was so um, good. I, I always thought that this was a spot in um that they stopped in another show that Stephen J. Cannell did that I mentioned. I forget it was with um the the, the Blade Runner scribe, the guy who bought the Blade Runner script. That he was an actor, you know, and there was a documentary about him. But he was in one of the police shows he was in. I think it was Car Car 54. I can't remember. But I feel like that back place that they stopped, they also stopped in that oh. episode. But I, I didn't bother to check. And I, I could be completely wrong because there's so many places that look similar to each other. Right, right. But, uh, but oh, yeah, this is a, such a such a uh, great um, pairing of these two performers in the scene. So it's the writing, the directing – and Larry Storch, and it was just so good. You can see Columbo just kind of cracking up, you know, like it is, it would be Columbo to, would kind of laugh, but it's little Peter Fox seeping out too. Yeah. He, Columbo asks, you don't remember Alvin Deschler? 
And Mr. Weekly <laughs> says, why should I? These people mean absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> oh, it's so yeah. good. Watch your right. Yeah. Always watch your right. And the left. Yeah. Your eye has the, to be The receptionist trained. at the DMV, um, I watched a couple episodes that she was in. Her name is um, Adrienne Ricard. And I watched a Sanford and Son she was in uh, and uh, Jefferson's. Um, but she had a very busy career getting small, you know, roles and stuff. But um, the uh, Sanford and Son she was in was called Ebenezer Sanford. And it was like a um, uh, Fred Sanford has like a it's kind of like it's a wonderful life mm-hmm. or, or um, Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, where, mm-hmm. where you, you have your the past Christmas yeah, the present. Ghosts yeah, all of that. It. yeah. And his son plays the plays the ghost of Christmas past. And <laughs> so funny. So good. They, those guys were. Where do you see Sanford and Sons? Is that on? That's not on Netflix. Um, Hulu. Where did I see it? Probably prime. Maybe it could be YouTube. Really? Some of it's on YouTube. That one. I, oh. I might've, I might've paid for that one, oh. but it, I th- but I think it's free. I usually try not to, unless it's something I really want to see, you know, cause there's so much yeah. available free stuff. Internet yeah. Archive, Amazon Prime. I think you could watch it with commercials. Both that one and the Jeffersons, I think. Okay. Um, and Fred Sanford sings a, uh, does like a Louis Armstrong kind of song at the end of that episode. Oh, it was a very fun. sweet, funny episode. And and Adrian Ricard, she plays like the mom to this boy that he kind of helps out. Um, but it's kind of cool to, to see, the, just to see this actress who, got to work with these really big actors, even though it was, even though it was just a couple lines, but I would love to have worked with uh, the guy from the Jefferson's Sherman Helmsley. I think his name was a red Fox or although oh, yeah. Dick Van Dyke said he did something with red Fox. And that was the only time that it was the first time since he was in kindergarten when he had to get to grab somebody. Um, but it, 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 he talks about it in his book. But but Red Fox was 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 not thinking straight. I think he was taking stuff. Um, well, that's too bad. And he had to stop him from 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 he he, he uh, thought he missed. He was saying Red Fox got confused as to what someone was saying, perhaps, and 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 he, because he was taking drugs and stuff, I think um, everything was kind of blown out of proportion in his head. And yeah. he misinterpreted what somebody had said too. So is according yeah. to Dick Van Dyke. So Dick Van Dyke had to grab him and say, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. He didn't mean that when he said this, Whoa. but anyway. Wow. Yeah. I forget what Drama. show that was. Yeah. So the main thing besides a wonderful back and forth, um, in this scene, we learned that yes, uh, Deschler took his test that morning. Oh, I did want to point out uh, in terms of location, Paul, I couldn't figure that out either, but I'm pretty sure they drive past the Galesco house in this scene. I'm pretty sure you can see it in the background. So that is, uh, oh gosh, let's go back up to, I believe it's Glendale. It is, yeah, West Kenneth Road in Glendale, California. So I believe they drive down West Kenneth Road and then they turn right on a larger street where they have the businesses and gas stations and stuff. Was that the area where they started, where where the tow truck was? I don't know if it's where they started, but I just know at some point you can see the Galesco home in the background. Mm, okay. Yeah, because that area too looked... I'm like, I wonder if I've been there. Like, was that in North Hollywood or, you know, I didn't, it's a, I didn't try It's a lot it of pretty fancy homes that they drive past at the beginning mm-hmm. before they get on the, on the busy commercial road. Okay, Paul, well, this episode is just about over. So we have a quick moment where Galesco is back in, it looks like the same office, yeah. great office that he was in during the art show, the photo show. And Hoffman, Sergeant Hoffman shows up and says, 
you need to come downtown with me. And if you don't come willingly, I'll have to issue a warrant or will have to issue a warrant for your arrest. So Galesco goes with Hoffman and now they're downtown. They're in the evidence room, the dungeon as the captain referred to it. And Columbo's down there and he is cutting letters out of a newspaper and Columbo lays it out. He says, I don't think Mr. Deschler killed your wife. I don't think he even met her. And then Columbo says, also, you have no alibi. And he reveals a photo of Mrs. Glasgow that he's had enlarged. So you can see the camera in the background, but Columbo has flipped it. He's reversed it. So that the clock, instead of saying 10 o'clock, the clock says 2 o'clock. Because there's no numbers. There's just tick marks on it. And Galasco says, oh, Columbo, you said it earlier. You're a little flawed. You're a little flawed. You're a little flawed. You've reversed the photo. (laughs) And get the original, and I will prove it to you that you've reversed the photo. And Columbo says, unfortunately, the original was destroyed because I dropped it in a batch of hydrochloric acid or something like that. (laughs) We ain't getting it. Yeah. Columbo tells Galesco the original is gone, but he swears by this work. He was very careful. He oversees the whole thing. And Galesco says, wait a minute before you do something you'll regret. You have another copy of the original. And Galesco finds the original camera on the shelf, the evidence shelf that's full of all kinds of cameras. And Galesco goes directly to the actual camera and pulls it off. And and then Columbo goes around and asks everyone in the room, were you a witness to what he just did? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then Hoffman says, you just incriminated yourself, sir. And this is such a fun gotcha because it finally, it slowly dawns on Galesco what has happened. And once again, this was, this was his ego getting him into trouble. He's like, yeah. I'm so smart. I'll, I'll show you the original. I'm a genius. You're an idiot. (laughs) But of course, this was part of Columbo's plan was for him to incriminate himself and find the original camera in front of multiple witnesses. And it dawns on Galesco and he says, you know, oh, you were planning on that. If I hadn't um, identified the camera, you wouldn't have any good evidence against me. And then here's that moment that I always reference where Galesco's escorted out by Hoffman and the other officers and Columbo's work is done and he gets up to go and then he sits back down on the table that he was working at and just kind of takes a pause. And it might be that he's exhausted. It might be that he's just bummed about humanity (laughs) because (laughs) here's another case of somebody murdering somebody else probably for money. Like we don't ever totally know hundred percent the motive, but it's, um, it's never a good reason. And this is another case where it's not a great reason. Yeah. Cause he shakes his head. Then he looks at the photograph and then, like you said, he has his coat on halfway and he just sits on the mm-hmm. table mm-hmm. and it stops. Yeah. And he kind of looks down, he kind of slumps, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, which is something you would do if you were really tired, but it would, it's also something you would do if you were like, gosh, what the yeah. heck? Like, Cause he's looking, is, he, yeah. What is ahead, wrong sorry. with people? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, he looks at the photograph as he's like, then he's in like, he stopped, but he's looking at the photograph and then he sits down. So like you said, I think it's, you know, he's reacting to like the senselessness of the darkness. Like they're just, you know, just the, why? 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 And God, that's why? negative reaction, Paul. We did it. Yeah. Woohoo. Woohoo. Such 10 a fun out of 10, one. baby. Yeah, let's hear it. Is that your rating? Just 10 kidding. out of 10? Uh, I was going to say 8.5. Uh, 
but just like going through it again with you, even though this is the third time I think I've seen this, um, uh, I, I, it's got to be higher. It's got to be like nine and a half or nine. It's, yeah. it's uh, so, so much great stuff in it. Yeah, same. I, I feel like the only thing maybe like a little more of, of between them maybe, like another between scene who? of Peter Falk and Dick Van Dyke. Like another where he's getting really frustrated with, with Columbo or something, but um, but there's there's a lot, but maybe it's partly because of the reaction where he's like, oh yeah, that's my wife. Well, you know, you know, so, sort of like the the energy is sort of like taken out of that potential moment. Yeah, I would. Um, but yeah, it's up there nine, at least nine out of ten. Awesome, nice. Yeah, I I gave this one a nine and a half out of ten. All right. And that was the same thing. It was like there's so many fun moments, so many amazing performances, not just Columbo and the main character. There's like seven other amazing performances. I mean, I didn't add them all up, but mm -hmm. there's Dolan, there's Sister Mercy, um, Hoffman, Magruder. Um, yeah. And then just and Mr. Weekly. Oh my goodness, Weekly. Mm -hmm. Larry Storch. So many fun things. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good cast. Really good. Really, really well cast. And the the, the that director, I gotta say, he turned it around. You know what I mean? Like he aces with this one. Yeah. And the gotcha at the end is very satisfying because we get to see him realizing everything. Mm -hmm. And just sort of like, oh, you know, having the, the wind knocked out of him, um, mm -hmm. which is fun. Because sometimes you don't totally get that satisfaction. In this case, you do. I love that. Yeah. Um, what else? There was one more thing I was going to say. Oh, all the great locations. You know, it's there's so many fun locations here. It's not all done at Universal Studios. Yeah, and the music. This was a different composer. I didn't. I didn't recognize the oh, name Bernardo Segal. I didn't even notice the music. Um, yeah, I did notice the music on this one. I thought it was really good. It was different than the other ones to me. Um, yeah, he. Was, this person was from uh, Brazil. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, I was. I was thinking of watching some of his other films, but I, you know, didn't get around to it. Oh, just to see Paul. <laughs> but he did. He ends man. up doing. He ends up doing <laughs> ten episodes, and this was his first one. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we'll so hear he does, him again. Yeah, by Don's Early Light playback, Deadly State of Mind, and he's in season five. He did five there, and in season six, he does one more. Um, but yeah, yeah. You have some good. trivia for me, Paul? Yes. Let's hear it. Okay. Um, so the Dick Van Dyke show, mom and dad used to watch and mom used to get jealous when dad would watch it. Cause he really liked watching Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> oh gosh, Paul. Um, okay. True. False. Oh, Paul. <laughs> they never watched it. Mommy. No, I'm just kidding. They did watch it. M mom would be cooking and then she would poke out. Her head, but she liked the show. Yeah, I think I, I I said to Dad, I said, "Well, if you had a poster of it, Mom of Mary Tyler Moore, Mommy, Mom might get jealous." <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> what did he say to that? Did he say yes. Yeah? Did he agree? Well, actually, I was talking to Mom at that point. Yeah, <laughs> and, and she just, I think she just kind of giggled. I think, but she's, I think she did say yes. I would get jealous if he had a poster. But she's like, you know what? He would be after Sophia Loren, which is kind of funny because. We see her behind Dick Van Dyke in this episode. <laughs> it's all connected. That's right. It's all synchronicity. What else you got, Paul? Oh, okay. So uh, one, one time I went to, a, um, to one of those, you know, uh, where they give homeless people food. And they thought I was homeless, so they gave me some food, the, the, the people at the shelter. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Where was this exactly? In Pasadena. <laughs> I'm going to say false. It's true. 
No, really? It's true. Yeah, yeah. You're I was... smiling so big right now. I, <laughs> I was trying to do it where it just, I sounded fake in saying it. Yes, Paul. No, no, yeah. It was like uh, we were Your still in Highland skills. Park. I was, I was in uh, Sondra, Sondra Kerr's class, and I was doing a uh, wedding for Godot. And I thought the characters might be homeless. I don't, you know, I don't think Samuel Beckett ever says what they are. So I wanted to do some homeless stuff. So I was like, oh, I wonder what it'd be like to sleep outside in the streets. And I did that. Wow. I slept in what a like streets a, over there by um, where the gold line stops by. Um, what is that? I mean, it's not as tough as, you know, downtown L.A. or, you know, some other areas. OMG, Paul. Um, but yeah, it was hard to sleep. It wasn't, I slept in the, like, I could hear other people sleeping around me too. It was interesting because you, like, you, you look in the areas and like, where can I sleep? No one's going to bother me, like the police or whomever, you know. Are you serious? This all feels like a giant fib. <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, because I really like, wanted like, to. On trust the ground. me, but the class was like, you had to like, however you thought you could imbue the character. I don't <laughs> recommend this to anybody, but for me, it was like. I kind of wanted to have, cause I thought that's what this guy was like. And I really it was comedic and weird, you know, like I really liked the role. It's a really good, interesting play. Um, OMG, Paul, I'm glad nothing happened to you sleeping on the streets. No. Yeah. No, that area is, I mean, now it's a little bit rougher. There's, you know, people do drugs over there now, but it's not, um, it wasn't that bad then, you know, did you, did you meet, um, but yeah, so I, Thomas Dolan? So I went the next day. Was Dolan down there? <laughs> yeah. No, I just, I remember there was a guy on his phone, like on a cell phone. And I'm like, this guy's homeless and he's on a cell phone. But of course he, you know, people, there's plenty of homeless people who, who, who have a kid with them, you know, who are doing whatever they can to make ends meet. But, um, yeah. Okay. So. Wow. Okay. So you let's bring it lost up. that on let's two. Come here. on, Liz. I know. Goodness gracious. I'm not doing well. Okay. Um, okay. So Dick Van Dyke, um, one of the things he was oh, really good at, he, he, could, <laughs> let me finish. Um, in the first episode of Dick Van Dyke show, it's either the first one or the second one. I'm not sure. He is so good. It's so funny. Carl Reiner wanted it to be real. He based it on his life as a TV writer. Dick Van Dyke plays a TV writer, but him and uh, this other actor who's a comedy writer, they're both comedy writers for TV. They, have to sort of schmooze at this party that some of the executives are at, but they do a skit and the, that's why they're invited to come because they can entertain the executives. And it's so funny and fun to watch this performance they do. And the final one that Dick Van Dyke does is where he plays this drunk character and the drunk guy, he comes home, he's after some drinks and he's performing this in the living room for all these executives. And, um, and as soon as the wife enters, he sobers up. But as soon as she turns around, he's all drunk again. So he's constantly going back and forth, and it's just <laughs> wonderful. He's so good at that. And he did it in also the comic, another Carl Reiner. It was a movie. It was loosely based on um, Stan Laurel from Laurel and Hardy or uh, Buster Keaton, like these silent slapstick, you know, physical, brilliant, different types of comedians for film from the older age. And those were his heroes too. Those were Dick Van Dyke's heroes. Cause you can see it in his work even. Uh, so in the comic there, they shot scenes in 16 millimeter and then they sort of wrinkled them up in the bathtub to make them look old. But there's a scene in the comic where you're seeing all of um, uh, Dick Van Dyke plays this, this washed up, actor he used to be famous when he was in the silent films as a physical comedy actor like Lowell and Hardy, Buster Keaton. But they show all of his films in this one montage. And in one of the films he plays like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it's the same thing when he takes the drink and is crazy, as soon as his wife comes in, he's normal again. But if she she turns around he's like ah and then she turns around he's like normal again. So he's he does this great flipping. And um I remember I remembered one of my favorite performances by Will Ferrell is in Saturday Night Live when he did this skit with Pierce Brosnan where he plays this crazy boss who interviews him and says like, man, we really want you to have on the team. We like your resume. You're so good. We, we just think you would just 
be wonderful here. And then one of Will Farrell's co-workers who's like under him comes up to him and says, uh, Mr. Dashiell, um, we didn't get the numbers. We didn't, I didn't fill out that page. And he starts shouting at her. Like he changes like that, like screaming at the top of his lungs, you idiot. I told you I wanted to. <laughs> and then he comes back to Pierce Brosnan. He's like, oh, so where were we? I, you know, like he's all nice again. So <laughs> and he, oh, he, he constantly does this sort of similar flipping mm-hmm. kind of thing that Dick Van Dyke did so well. Very different. So here's my thing. Okay. So his, his heroes were Stan Laurel for Laurel Hardy and like Buster Keaton. And he, he never got to meet them, but he ended up being the, um, giving the eulogy, the main eulogy at both of their funerals. Oh my gosh, Paul, how am I supposed to know this? <laughs> the okay. Main eulogy at both of their funerals. Okay, he actually did meet them. How about that? And okay, he, and then... he did the, the eulogies at their funerals. Wait, you're not letting me guess? No, no, no. Is that true or false? Yes, true. Yes, it's all true. Yeah. Yes, I got one. <laughs> yeah, he met Stan. He looked up Stan Laurel's name in the phone book and found it. He was living in Santa Monica. And then he would go and he became really good friends. And, uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, Jerry Lewis... Uh, heard that he was friends with him and he's like, he, he'd love to meet you. And Jerry Lewis would call him up, go see him and see him like once a month for, until he had passed on. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to read about that. It's really cool. Should I give you another one? Or are we done? Well, you gave me three and I failed horribly. Um, but I did get one, right? Well, there's a documentary that just came out about Mary Teller Moore. Uh-huh. And in that, she said that, uh, I think this is true. I didn't watch it, but my coworker was telling me. She said that the reason the Dick Van Dyke show stopped is because Dick Van Dyke wanted it to, to stop after five seasons. Like it was all his decision. I'm going to say true. Yeah. According to the documentary, it's true. Yes. But in his book, in his book... In his book, he says it was Carl Reiner. Oh. And he said the press never would believe that it wasn't his choice. And even though he, he was like, he said it was like talking into the wind. Um, How interesting. So, but, you know, we can always misremember things and or see things differently. And But he was saying Carl Reiner thought it would go stale if they couldn't do any more seasons after that. And he's very specific. He, he talks about it for two pages. Oh, wow. Um, how it was not his decision. And I think in the documentary, my coworker said that it, they, Mary Teller Moore quoted him and the newspaper quoted him as saying that or something like that. So, but you know, maybe it was a combination. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Feels like it could be a combo. I mean, five years of doing, was his show every night, like a Monday through Friday thing? Oh, uh, no, I don't. Well, it was like 39 episodes a season or something like that, which is a lot, you know? Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Well, but not a nightly show, but still, that's a lot of work. It was live. It was live, too. Yeah. Which is very different. But what I've seen of it, I've only watched um, four episodes, and um, it's really fantastic. Oh, that's Coyotes. Oh, cool. Coyotes Can in you your hear them? No. Can you hear the rain that started here at my house? Oh, wow. Uh-oh. It, started, it just started pouring while we were recording. Oh, I do want to say this thing. is very different. It has nothing to do with anything but Carl Reiner. Let's hear it. Okay. There's a couple things he mentions as weird in his that's happened in his life. And it's in, it's in his autobi- one of his autobiographies. All right. I'm here for it, Although Paul. he wouldn't call it an autobiography. Carl Reiner, you know, Lay he did the jerk. Me. He did the jerk. He directed yes. the jerk. It's a good one. Um. His son called him one night and said, hey, dad, what was the name of that town? How do you spell the name of that town? Um, I don't know why his son couldn't look it up. Maybe they didn't have the internet at that time. Um, But he wanted the correct spelling for the town where their ancestors were from over in Europe somewhere. I think it might have been Germany or Sweden. I can't remember. And so Carl said, 
Uh, it's spelled C U R W T I Z L G, you know, whatever. And then he said, Hold on, son, there's somebody at the door. He goes to the door and it's a package for him. He opens the package and he said, Oh, you know what, son? It's not spelled that way. It's spelled C U R blah, 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 blah. And his son goes, well, How do you know that's not what you said before? He said, Because I just got a book that has the correct spelling and it's a book about the town. And then he said, oh, are you kidding? He's like, no, I'm not kidding. And the reason he got the book was he met a guy a few years ago at a party from that town. And he was writing a book about the town he was from. And Carl said, that's where my ancestors are from. He said, if you ever finish writing that book, send me it. And he sent it to him. And that was the day he got it. The same moment his son Whoa. said, dad, how do you spell that? Isn't that kind of cool? That is cool. Weird. Yeah, he has another one in there like that. Um, but that that one was really good. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. He's like, I don't know what that was. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I don't know what the timing. That's some pretty good timing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is he still alive, Carl Reiner? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. No, he passed away 2020. Oh, and so he was up. Well, his son, you know, his son's a big director. Dang, he was 98 years old when he passed away. Way to go, Carl. Amazing. Yeah, I know oh, him. I forgot he was in the Oceans movies. Yeah, that's, what? I know him from Ocean, the Oceans movies. Yeah. He's so good in those. But I know I also know his name because you talk about him and a lot of other people talk about Carl Reiner. He's had a big impact on Hollywood. Yeah. Dad loved the 2,000-year-old man skit that he would do with Mel Brooks. And I think that um, I want to say that Stephanie, our sister-in-law, her dad did that skit for us. Oh, really? At the beach. Yeah. <laughs> was that that one or was it another one? I was one? not there for that, if that happened. It might have been another one. Yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> this was a few years ago. Well, several years ago. Who you mean, like a few decades ago, Paul. Yeah, Paul, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> 30 years ago, buddy. You're 75 years old now, Paul. Don't forget that. <laughs> All right. So who do we have to thank okay. tonight? We have to thank a few people and we'll wrap this up. Dear listener, send you on your way. Thank you so much for listening to us wander here tonight. Um, we want to thank Maxime Gervais for our theme song, Columbo. This podcast is edited by John Warenas. Thank you so much, John. And if you'd like to add to our conversation, you can email us at trenchcoat cigar at gmail.com or find us on Instagram. We are at trench coat cigar and we are on Patreon or patreon.com slash trench coat cigar. If you would like to show a little support for our show, we would appreciate it so much. And if you can't donate to our show, just giving us a rating or a review wherever you listen is a huge help. We really, really appreciate that. It helps more listeners find us. So thank you for doing that. And Paul, just one more thing. Go on. Thanks for listening. Chaque détail, l'inspecteur Colombo pensera toujours en dehors.